Chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm joined today by other members of the committee. We have Brad Lander from Brooklyn, Kyverton Coswitz from Queens, Margaret Chin from Manhattan, and Peter Ku from Queens. Today the committee will hold a hearing on four pieces of legislation. All the bills relate to the regulation of the growing sightseeing tour bus industry in the city of New York. As early as 1904, the first sightseeing vehicles, electrically powered observation automobiles, took to the streets, city streets, ferrying tourists about, around and about the city. These vehicles were a popular novelty that reached a top speed of four miles per hour and shared the streets with horse-drawn carriages and liveries. Since then, both the tourism industry and the number of sightseeing buses have increased significantly. Tourism is important to the city's economy. In 2017, an all-time record of 61 million visitors came to NYC. Tourists spent nearly $4.2 billion in 2016. According to reports, the number of sightseeing buses tripled from 2003 to 2013, going from 57 vehicles to 231 in 2016. According to the Department of Consumer Affairs, there are currently nine businesses licensed to operate 197 sightseeing buses. The city's roads infrastructure has not changed significantly in this time period. The increase in the number of large double-decker sightseeing buses on the road has contributed to complaints and concerns regarding traffic congestion, pollution, and noise. The council has worked to address these concerns fairly, taking into account the needs of residents, tourists, and the industry. In 2005, the council passed Local Law 41, requiring sightseeing buses to employ the best available retrofit technology to reduce diesel emissions. In 2010, the council responding to the noise complaints of residents regarding the loud open air public address systems used by tour guides to communicate with, the, with their patrons passed Local Law 15, requiring a headphone limited sound reproduction system. Recently, there have been growing concerns regarding traffic congestion and safety, especially in light of a number of disturbing high profile accidents involving tour buses. In August of 2014, two sightseeing buses collided in Times Square and at least 15 people were injured. All but one of the injured were pedestrians. The driver of, the, of one of the buses in the incident was arrested and charged with driving while impaired. The driver's license has been suspended 11 times previously. On July 3, 2015, a sightseeing bus struck a man in Greenwich Village, pinned him beneath the bus wheels, and mangled at least one of his legs. On July 21, 2016, 13 people were injured aboard a sightseeing bus when it mounted the curb and crashed into a tree along Central Park. The crash shut down Fifth Avenue for five hours. The council has an obligation to the safety of residents and tourists alike to examine this matter seriously and take reasonable steps to prevent future occurrences. Part of the difficulty in regulating the city's, city's sightseeing buses are the myriad of laws and regulations that currently govern the industry. Late last year, New York State Senator Brad Hoyleman's office released a report titled, Thrown Under the Bus, How Lax State Laws for Double Decker Tour Buses Are Endangering the Lives of New Yorkers. The report found that the laws governing New York City's sightseeing buses create a multi-jurisdictional web riddled with loopholes, contradictions, and lowered standards that combine to allow, to allow sightseeing bus companies to operate in an environment with limited oversight and lax enforcement. The introduction of these four bills today is an effort to address and close some of those loopholes, provide stricter regulations of the city's sightseeing buses, and ensure the safety of New York City residents and tourists alike. The first bill to address these concerns is intro 289A, this bill will amend the administrative code to require all double-decker sightseeing buses to have at least one employee present on the upper level at all times while passengers are present. To further enhance safety measures, intro number 727 would establish basic requirements for, for sightseeing bus drivers, such as ensuring a good driving record, a clean license, and prohibiting a driver from operating a sightseeing bus for more than 12 hours during a 24-hour period. This bill would require tour bus companies to align their hiring practices accordingly. The bill would also require the companies to inform the agency of any accidents or traffic infraction involving their tour buses within one business day of the incident. Sightseeing bus companies must submit a list of all of its bus drivers to the Department of Consumer Affairs. The company must also register New York licensed drivers in the Department of Motor Vehicles license event notification system. Additionally, sightseeing bus companies shall maintain driving records for all employee dr bus drivers and must make these records available for inspection by the Department of Consumer Affairs. Intro number 723 would require sightseeing bus companies to submit operating plans to the Department of Transportation and get prior written authorization for such plans and the use of bus stops before being issued a sightseeing bus license from DCA. 
In order to issue the authorization from the city's Department of Transportation, must take into account traffic, pedestrian flow, and public safety. Lastly, intro number 725 would address congestion and safety concerns by amending the current licensing scheme to cap the total number of sightseeing buses allowed to operate to, at, two, at 225. I look forward to the testimony today from, from the administration, the industry, community, and business groups, and other interested parties. Before I call on, the, on our first panel, I'd like to give uh, my colleague Margaret Chin, a, a bill co-sponsor, a bill sponsor, a chance to say a few words. Thank you, Chair Espinal, and thank you for chairing this hearing uh, so that we can hear intro 725, legislation introduced by me and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer to create limits to the number of sightseeing tour buses that are allowed to operate on the streets of our city. I represent Lower Manhattan, and I have some of the most attractive areas for tourists, which include Washington Square Park, Soho, the historic Battery, Wall Street, Chinatown, and even Governor's Island. Just last year, a record high 61.8 million visitors came to New York City to visit, shop, and eat. While tourism is flourishing, lifelong New Yorkers living in these tourist hotspots experience endless congestion, noise, and air pollution that sightseeing buses largely contribute to. Just imagine if on a cool spring day like today, you want to crack the window open for some fresh air. Instead of a cool breeze, you get a steady stream of noxious fumes. That's what far too many of my residents deals with every single day. Whenever I see one pass by, I can count the number of passengers with one hand. Most of the time, these double-decker buses serve no other real purpose than as an advertisement on wheels. With the L train shutdown looming around the corner, we have little time to waste. We need to set ground rules for these industry now and create immediate solution to reduce traffic gridlock on already congested streets. Yeah. Intro 725 will limit the number of license plates that the Department of Consumer Affairs can issue to sightseeing buses. We need to strike a balance to accommodate our city's vital tourism industry while still addressing the concern that our residents experience. Once again, I want to thank Chair Espinal for providing me with an opportunity to speak on this important issue and for hearing this bill. And I look forward to hearing from DCA sightseeing bus operators and members of the public to achieve this balance and secure true relief for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I'd like to call up the first panel. We have Casey Adams of, DC, of Department of Consumer Affairs, Mary Cooley of DCA, uh, Kenny Manaya of DCA and Alex Keaton of DOT. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna lead off here. Um, good afternoon, Chair Espinal and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. My name is Alex Keating. I'm the Director of Special Projects for Transportation Planning and Management at NYC DOT. And I'm happy to be back before this committee once again to discuss sightseeing bus legislation, as I was in September 2016. I'm testifying today with my DCA colleague, Casey Adams. As you know, DOT and DCA share responsibility for regulating and authorizing sightseeing bus companies operating in New York City. With DCA as the licensing agency and DOT granting use of the curb for loading and unloading passengers at designated stops. As Mayor de Blasio and NYC and Company recently announced, with 62 million visitors, 2017 was New York's eighth consecutive year for record-breaking tourism. We are fortunate that New York is a destination for people from across the country and the world. Tourists come to experience our wonderful city and fuel our economy to the tune of over $40 billion in spending each year, supporting more than 360,000 jobs. But with an unprecedented number of residents, commuters, and tourists, a booming economy, and a surge in construction, we have increased competition for our limited amount of street space in the roadway, at the curb, and on the sidewalk. As such, we must continue managing our streets to support the most efficient uses and sustainable transportation modes in order to maximize mobility and ensure that this growth benefits all who live in or visit our city. 
Simultaneously, to achieve our vision zero goal of eliminating traffic-related fatalities and serious injuries, we are using every tool at our disposal to improve the safety of our streets. Therefore, as we previously said, DOT recognizes the need to better regulate the sightseeing bus industry. When we last testified in 2016, the number of sightseeing buses had grown to 237. Since then, it has fluctuated back down to the current level of 197 licensed buses. While this is not a large number of vehicles relative to total road users, sightseeing buses are large vehicles with a significant curb use impact. They also predominantly travel through and stop within the busiest, densest parts of our city's central core, often overlapping with transit operations such as the MTA buses that carry New Yorkers on 2.5 million trips every day across the city. DOT requires all companies requesting authorization for bus stops to provide their proposed schedule information. Once DOT authorizes a stop, we require timely updates to any changes to the schedules or bus ownership. As we described previously, in 2016, DOT conducted a study of the sightseeing bus industry. As part of that study, we collected data at 14 locations monitoring over 1,200 sightseeing bus arrivals and departures. We found that most stops averaged about four to nine buses per hour. Peak sightseeing operations took place mainly between noon and 4 p.m. each day and started to steadily drop off later in the day. During peak times, we saw double running when companies utilized two buses for every one scheduled to stop and, frequent, and arrival frequencies in excess of the schedule submitted for authorization. While two-thirds of the buses were observed loading and unloading passengers within three minutes or less, 17% stayed at the curb for more than 10 minutes, particularly at certain locations. We observed instances of obstructing the travel lane or contributing to sidewalk crowding. We also saw examples of good actors at major destinations expeditiously loading and unloading passengers as required by our traffic rules. As we explained at the previous hearing, DOT's bus stop management unit receives requests from multiple types of bus operators seeking permission for loading and unloading of customers. This includes MTA buses, inner city buses such as Mega Bus and Bolt Bus, public transportation buses such as New, York, New Jersey Transit, as well as sightseeing buses. For each bus stop request, DOT assesses the conditions at the particular location. We comprehensively consider traffic patterns and existing traffic and curb regulations. If the request is for a bus stop location utilized by another operator, including the MTA, we will assess whether the new proposed service can be accommodated in addition to the current usage based on the submitted schedule. DOT may decide to deny a bus stop request for reasons including narrow sidewalks, likelihood of disrupting traffic, potential pedestrian congestion, or loss of parking and commercial loading areas. Also, we avoid proximity to hospitals, fire stations, and police precincts so as not to interfere with emergency vehicles. Curb regulations and street use are always changing, but under current conditions, little available curb space remains in the immediate vicinity of the most popular tourist locations in Manhattan, which have the highest demand for stops from sightseeing bus companies. DOT rejects stop requests due to capacity issues at these heavily used locations. On the other hand, certainly many locations throughout the city do, do have the capacity for additional sightseeing bus operations, and in the past DOT has worked to designate new sightseeing bus stop locations, in some cases at the request of elected officials. Turning to the legislation before Council today, DOT supports the Speaker's bill, Intro 723. Similar to 713A from the previous term, Intro 723 would mandate that sightseeing bus companies first have authorization from DOT for all of their bus stops before receiving an operating license from DCA. Under the bill, the process for assigning stops would be similar to our process for citing inner city bus stops, including community board consultation process. It also makes clear that a failure to abide by the conditions of such authorizations can lead to their revocation and, that, and makes such revocation a potential cause for the loss of the DCA license. Currently, sightseeing bus operators can be granted DCA license without receiving approval from DOT for their proposed stop locations and schedules. This contributes to buses on the streets utilizing unauthorized stops, including MTA bus stops, locations authorized for other companies, or curb locations with no authorized bus stop. Intro 723 also includes a requirement that any company granted a sightseeing bus stop authorization must subsequently provide real-time electronic tracking data in the form and frequency to be determined by DOT. 
Sightseeing bus operators very likely already collect GPS location information, and DOT would promulgate rules and develop a process for re regular reporting. By showing where buses are actually traveling and stopping, that data would enable DOT to more effectively monitor the site that sightseeing buses are operating in line with approved schedules at stops and could help target enforcement. This data would also, will also complement other data sources, such as the taxi, GPS, MTA bus time data, to paint a more complete and accurate picture of conditions on our roads. We, com we commend the additional work on this bill since its prior incarnation as intro 713A, and would like to thank Speaker Johnson for his partnership. Sightseeing buses heavily affect the speaker's district and are certainly a topic he knows well. Combined with strong enforcement, these changes, including a few additional technical amendments we'd be happy to discuss, would help ensure that DOT can effectively authorize bus stops in a coordinated manner and prevent oversaturation of activity at particular locations. Finally, when it comes to including the viability of bus route among the criteria that DOT would be required to use as a basis for authorizing sightseeing bus stops, DOT's appropriate role should be in determining whether particular location can accommodate a company's proposed schedule of pickups and drop-offs, not making a determination as to the routes used between designated stops. Turning to intro 725, which would cap the number of sightseeing bus license plates at 225, we defer to, in general, to DCA as the issuer of sightseeing bus licenses, since they would be responsible for administering any cap. DOT does not want to discourage competition in the form of new entrants into the market or prevent the potential growth of these services elsewhere in the city, including new locations where they may be desired, while at the same time not necessarily reducing problematic activity at presently oversaturated locations we know are of concern to council members. But we do agree that we should manage the impacts of sightseeing buses to prevent problematic curb uses and prevent oversaturation, and we, are, and we welcome efforts to strengthen the city's ability. Finally, I will defer to my colleagues at the Department of Consumer Affairs to address intro 727 and 289. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on sightseeing bus regulations in New York City and the proposed legislation. I look forward to answering any questions following testimony from my DCA colleagues. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Espinal and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. My name is Casey Adams, and I am the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. I am joined today by some of my colleagues from the department, and of course, Alex Keating from the Department of Transportation. I would like to thank you all for inviting DCA to testify about introductions 289, 723, 725, and 727, all of which relate to the regulation of the sightseeing bus industry in New York City. Currently, DCA licenses eight sightseeing bus companies uh, along with one company whose renewal is currently pending, that together operate 197 vehicles. DCA enforcement staff inspect all sightseeing buses at least once every four months to ensure that they are in compliance with local laws and rules which mandate, among other things, the posting of consumer disclosures and rate schedules, the maintenance of a clean and sanitary interior, as well as functioning exterior lights, signaling devices, and windshield wipers, and the installation of headphone-limited sound reproduction systems. In addition, sightseeing buses must be inspected every six months by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, as well as the New York State Department of Transportation for compliance with emissions and road state safety standards, respectively. We appreciate the opportunity to be here today with our partners from DOT to discuss proposed changes to the regulation of the sightseeing bus industry. This industry plays an important role in supporting our city's booming tourist economy, as others have pointed out, and we share a collective goal to ensure that important industries can thrive and that consumers including both tourists and native New Yorkers, are protected. We believe that some of the proposals being discussed today would help to streamline existing regulatory processes without sacrificing protections for consumers. I will offer brief, brief comments on each bill before us today. First, I will discuss Intro 289, a bill that requires sightseeing bus companies that operate double-decker buses to ensure that an employee is stationed on the top deck of a bus whenever consumers are present there. The top deck employee must be licensed as a sightseeing guide by DCA. As a policy matter, DCA takes no position on the desirability or necessity of having a second employee present on the top decks of sightseeing buses, but we look forward to hearing more from the council and advocates here today about why this change is needed. 
We note that under current law, licensed sightseeing guides who drive sightseeing buses are already prohibited from explaining, describing, or lecturing while a bus is in motion. A driver who is not a licensed sightseeing guide may not explain, describe, or lecture regardless of whether that bus is in motion. Intro 723 requires that sightseeing bus companies obtain stop authorizations from DOT before applying for a license from DCA. Currently, the law does not require sightseeing bus companies to have stops assigned in order to obtain a license from us. In addition, the bill allows DCA to suspend or revoke a company's license if DOT revokes one or more of the bus stop authorizations. DCA supports Intro 723 because we believe it will streamline the regulatory process and more closely align licensing requirements with broader traffic impacts. Introduction 725 would cap the number of sightseeing bus license plates at 225, preventing DCA from issuing additional license plates above that number. Individual license plates are distinct from the license that must be obtained by a sightseeing bus company. One license company may have many license plates in circulation. In fact, Gray Line and City Sites, which together comprise Twin America, currently hold 93 plates, or almost half of all active plates. At, that, at the moment, there is no cap on the number of license plates that can be issued either overall or to an individual company. DCA would like to offer a note of caution about this proposal. As we stated at the Council's 2016 hearing on an earlier version of this bill, a competitive market is often good for consumers because it may put downward pressure on prices and push companies to innovate. Today, the sightseeing bus market in New York City is highly consolidated. DCA reviewed historical licensing data back to 1991 and found that the eight companies and one pending company currently holding active licenses is equal to the lowest number of companies licensed for any year studied and is well below the historical average of 20 companies for the years we reviewed. Today, there are eight companies, again with one pending, operating a total of 197 buses. In 1995, for example, there were 27 companies operating 144 sightseeing buses. Under a cap system, current licensees would be able to renew their existing license plates, giving current market participants another advantage over new entrants in a business that already has high barriers to entry, undermining, potentially, competitive pressures that can work to the benefit of consumers. In addition, capping the number of license plates could undercut incentives for companies to expand tours outside Manhattan. At the Council's 2016 hearing, Council members from Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Queens remarked that their communities also have much to offer sightseers and tourists, but only seldom see the sightseeing buses and other tourism businesses that could benefit local small businesses by bringing in foot traffic and spending power. Limiting the number of available buses could push companies to place them in tried and true markets, as we know, mostly in Manhattan, rather than exploring new and untested routes in other communities across the city. Introduction 727 would prohibit sightseeing buses from employing drivers unless they meet certain requirements. The administrative code required DCA to issue sightseeing bus driver licenses until 1995, when that provision was repealed as duplicative of state requirements. DCA understands that council intends to hold companies accountable for hiring safe and qualified drivers, and we commend that goal. However, many of the requirements in this bill especially those related to driver safety and infraction records, partially overlap with state laws and rules governing commercial driver's licenses or the standard promulgated by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration on which they are based. It is important to remember that DCA is a consumer protection and licensing agency, not a traffic safety agency like the state entities that regulate and issue CDLs in New York and other states. We recommend that the bill be amended to require that companies hire only those persons who hold a CDL valid to operate a, a sightseeing bus from either New York or another state whose licenses are reciprocally recognized by the New York State Department of Motor Vehicles. Under this approach, DCA would be able to issue a violation to a company that fails to ensure that its pro drivers are properly qualified by a traffic safety agency with the mandate, means, and expertise to test and monitor those qualifications. Again, I would like to thank the opportunity uh, to the committee for the opportunity to testify today. We share the Council's goal of ensuring that sightseeing buses are safe, clean, and dependable experiences for the millions of tourists that make New York City one of the world's top tourist destinations every year, and for the New Yorkers who share our streets with these vehicles. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have along with my colleague.
Thank you for your testimony. Um, before I hand it over to my colleagues, I just want to ask one question. Uh, so you inspect the buses once every four months to check the cleanliness and whether the buses are up to standard and safety? That's right, in addition to the qualifying inspection, which is separate. Now, do you, when you do those inspections, are, are they scheduled inspections or, or do you walk in unannounced? Uh, generally, they're scheduled inspections. Okay. And, when, and for the qualified inspection, um, part of the licensing process is that the company must submit a roster of buses and a request for inspection. So we do make an effort to uh, accommodate the company in the scheduling of inspections because it is a disruption to their business process to have their entire fleet inspected. Okay. Now, and regarding to, to the 727, the, the, lic the license uh, bill, uh, you mentioned that uh, DCA is not a traffic safety agency, right? Do you not believe that protecting the consumers on the buses from uh, a possible accident is probably a consumer protection issue? Absolutely, we feel that consumers on these buses should be protected as a traffic safety matter, and we think that the most effective way to do that is to directly link company responsibility to uh, monitoring and regulation by an agency that has the expertise and the resources to do so. Um, because New York State issues these CDLs, we think that the company should be held accountable for hiring people who are qualified under uh, that agency's laws and rules and hold a CDL. Yeah. So before I go on to my next question, I just want to give my colleagues a chance to, to ask questions because I, I understand that they have schedules. Councilman Peter Koo. <coughs> thank you, Chair Raphael. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming to testify. Yeah. Yeah. My question to you is uh, on the cap, the proposed cap on sightseeing buses. You said that um, you might hurt tourism. Uh, especially in the Manhattan. But you also mentioned uh, before uh, there are not too many buses to go to outer boroughs. So maybe we can have a cap on, in Manhattan and open up more uh, licenses to, uh, to work, bus tour coming to go to Queens, go to Bronx, and go to Staten Island. You know, just like the, the taxi. We have the yellow taxi and the green taxi, right? So we open the category of sightseeing buses to the outer boroughs. Uh, that will increase tourism uh, in, in outer boroughs to help uh, the local economy of outer boroughs. So would, that take, would you take that suggestion? Certainly we're open to having a discussion uh, with you about potential amendments to the proposal. I think that we share the goal of ensuring that communities that would like these businesses have the opportunity to get them and are not um, held up by, uh, by government agencies. I think we work with, with our examples in the past where we've worked with communities that would like to see new sightseeing bus stops in their, uh, in their areas, and we've done that successfully. And I think that, um, I, as my colleagues from DOT pointed out in their testimony, the Speaker's Bill is really a great opportunity to start gathering the type of information that would inform um, a proposal that might place restrictions on, um, on certain parts of the city or better encourage companies to, uh, to expand to places that are underserved by these businesses right now. So the, uh, the bill requires the submission of GPS data to the Department of Transportation, and I think that will be a great data source for thinking about how uh, we might address the, some of the issues that you've brought up. I have one more question, yeah. Uh, on the sightseeing guys, uh, uh, what are the licensing requirements uh, to be a guy, a sightseeing guy in Manhattan? Or, or what kind of knowledge they have? They have? Do you have a test for them, or do they have to be a resident of this area? So, what are the requirements? So, the specifically, what I think you're getting to, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is. Uh, how do we test the qualifications of sightseeing guides to ensure that they know the area that they're guiding people around? Is that fair? Because um, I think the answer to that is that we do have, uh, we have a test for sightseeing guides. And the uh, a sightseeing guide has to pass the test in order to, to, to obtain the license. Is there a residence, residency requirement? I mean, they have to live in New York City to be a guide, right? Uh, I don't believe so, no. no. I think we should, yeah. Because if you go to Europe, they always hire local guys. You know. And when you, whenever you go to a different city, they, they change the guy. They use the local tour guy. You cannot. There's no local guy for the whole Europe. You know, or 
Oh, the, so we should prefer the peop uh, people with at least they live in the five boroughs, you know, to be a sightseeing guy. So help the uh, local people to have better jobs. Huh? I think we share the goal of making sure that people who are licensed by New York City as sightseeing guides have a, a wide ranging knowledge of local tourist attractions and can provide you know, accurate information about all the historical heritage uh, and attractions that our city has to offer. And, and we think that, our, that that is the purpose behind our test and that it serves that purpose well by ensuring that the guides have that knowledge before they obtain the license. So, so why now there's no requirement they have to be New, New York City resident? I don't believe so, no. No. So maybe we can add the requirement to the licensing test. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, first, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Keating um, I was about your um, study in 2016 when you look at the, the 14 uh, location. Um, when you were tracking the, looking at the buses uh, coming down, did you also do a head count? Or like, a, did, you, did you take down notes about whether uh, the bus was full of people or they were they empty, or there are people on the top level or the lower level. Did did you take that into in your survey? Sure, I'd, I'd have to go back to uh, the exact data that we worked up with our consultant on this too. But I, I believe we were not looking at volume, uh, ridership volumes on the buses as part of the study. We were mainly focused on the part of the process that we regulate, which is the access to the curb, layover, uh, things like that, and 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 to what extent they were impeding traffic or causing issues on, on uh, sidewalks. Yeah, if you could check, because that, that would be an important component, because in the last couple of years, uh, what's troubling us and the residents in the neighborhood is that a lot of these double, you know, double deck of bus are rolling billboards. Because you see that all of them have, you know, painted all over, so no one is sitting downstairs. You might have a few people sitting upstairs, but when you have about four to nine buses coming down, I mean, we were on Broadway, um, and we saw buses. We took pictures of buses coming down, and there were a lot of them were empty. And that's why all the congestions and, and the fumes and the pollution is because, yeah, they got the license, and they're making money from the advertisement. Last session when we had the hearing, I could not get any information from the tour company or from DOT or from DCA. The amount of money that's being generated from these rolling billboards. Nobody gave me that information, right? But my constituents are telling me, hey, this is what's going on. And if you walked out, even right in front of 250, that's a bus stop. And you have more than one bus you know, coming by, and oftentimes, it's not full. So, hey, we welcome tourists to the city. I would love to have more, you know, tourists, but our tourists, they walk. Especially in Manhattan, low Manhattan, the best way to look at the sights and experience New York is by walking. Take the subway, take the bus, and get off, and just explore the neighborhood. But what's going on right now with this industry is that they're taking advantage of the license and the plates that they have, and, and that's what's going on. So we want to find a way uh, to balance, to regulate, to make sure that New Yorkers who lives here, that we're not suffering from this growing industry. So I know that you were talking about some concern about competition and all that. Well, help us figure out a way. I mean, as my colleague is saying, you know, maybe issues license just for the other borough, because we do want them to visit other borough. But even within Manhattan, they don't stop at every neighborhood. A lot of them don't stop in Chinatown. They just pass through on Broadway, they don't make a stop. Or they go up Bowery, they don't make a stop. So if the, I think the, the other legislation, 723, the, the speaker's bill, that will also help us scatter the data. Where are they stopping? They're stopping at Soho, wow, they're there constantly, and the village. And that's why we hear directly from a lot of constituents. So 
Do you have any suggestions in terms of how we can find that balance and, and look at, you know, to encourage competition, but to really regulate the tourism industry? Because uh, you see those billboards. I mean, you see those uh, advertisements. It wasn't like that a couple of years back. And some of the company that are doing most of those advertisements, I bet you they're the one that has most of the buses. Yeah, I mean, I, I would first go back to the provisions in Intro 723, which uh, add some sort of some teeth to the authorization process in terms of being able to revoke uh, a bus stop authorization if we're seeing that the company is not meeting the schedule and service level that they present, and that GPS data would go a long way to helping us do that. Um, so, I mean, any bus on the road should have an authorized stop, and it should be meeting, you know, meeting the schedule proposed. So I think being able to really regulate that with, with more information will, will go a long way to helping us, A, understand what is really happening uh, out on, on the road, and also uh, be able to, to back up those regulations that, that, are, and that are set in the permit authorization. And also for DCA, I mean, do you check on these buses regularly or do some spots check? Because I know that we passed the bill about using headsets. And it's like, they don't check. Unless, oh, you have to have it there, but like whether they're using it or not, um, it's not being checked on a regular basis. So yeah, the company could have a, the, uh, the megaphone with a headset on the bus, but if they don't use it, nobody uh, penalized them for not using it. So to the first part of your question, yes, DCA inspects these, all these buses regularly. Uh, we, do, we are required by law to inspect them at least three times a year in addition to the qualifying inspection each time a company requests a new plate. Uh, and part of that inspection, and we put out an inspection checklist, uh, which is on our website and we can share with you so that companies know what we're looking for and the public knows what we're looking for, um, is the check on the headphone limited sound reproduction system, which was a bill uh, that, this, that the council passed. Uh, so every bus has to have that headphone reproduction system. DCA does not, however, do the in the field enforcement. Uh, that is within the jurisdiction of the NYPD. It's, Pat, well, it's NYPD again. I mean, uh, it's also it's, it's complaint driven. Uh, but DCA should really look at, just like DOT, there's got to be some regular inspection uh, to make sure that the, the tour operators, the sightseeing operators, are abiding by the rules. Um, the other question that I have is that since when they come to apply, like these double-decker bus, they should be using both level, right? But how do you check them when they are coming with their, the bus that they are, they are putting on the street, do not have people riding on the lower level because they're painted over. Like with someone who's buying a ticket, they're not gonna sit downstairs because they can't see anything. So on the automatic, all that seat is wasted. So is DCA, is there a way for you to monitor whether these companies are actually giving you the right amount of information. I mean, if, then it's not a double-decker bus. I mean, it's like they're only providing an X number of seats. So DCA requires that these companies submit a great deal of information. As I said at the beginning, no bus is given a plate by DCA unless it has a certificate of inspection from the New York State Department of Transportation, as well as a certificate of conformity issued by the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And we don't schedule an inspection until we have those documents. And then once we have them, our inspectors go out and check for all the things I mentioned um, I mentioned at the top. In terms of the, the split level, whether seats are being used, DC doesn't have the authority right now to require that uh, there be a certain uh, distribution of passengers on a bus. Shouldn't DC require that? We I mean, it's just, they said that they're advertising as a double-decker bus, right? They're going to be supposed to be providing 50 seats, but they're only providing 25. We don't, we've received no complaints from consumers that they are unable to use a lower level of a bus, but if we did, we would follow up on that, but we haven't received any. But I'm well, a lot of them are tourists. They're not, they exist here a couple of days, mm -hmm. right? They're we not going to 
They're not going to complain, but why couldn't DCA be more proactive on that? I mean, I would urge you to take that back. I mean, I don't know if we have to do another legislation, but I mean, it makes common sense, right? If they're coming in to license a double-decker bus and they're not providing double-decker service, because DCA and DOT, on their regulations uh, about rolling billboards, don't they have to, uh, it's a, isn't it a special license for uh, advertisement to, to be driving around? Sure. Um, so I am aware that under DOT's existing rules, there are some restrictions on commercial advertising on vehicles. Um, we would be happy to follow up on, on what those are and how they're enforced. That would be great. I think we should definitely take a look at that because that is what's going on, is moving advertisement. And this has happened in the last couple of years, and they're making money. So the city really needs to know how much revenue are being collected because they're clogging up our street and causing a lot of construction pro congestion problems. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Margaret, for uh, hitting on all those important questions. Um, so I just have two questions. Do all, do all sightseeing bus drivers possess a CDL? There's, some, there's been some confusion whether they do or not. It's our understanding that all sightseeing bus drivers must possess a commercial driver's, commercial driver's license under state law in order to operate the type of vehicles that are typically operated by these companies. Right, okay. But obviously the actual requirement exists within the state law. Okay, so we should look further into that. Now, are the buses commercial, considered commercial vehicles? The way that commercial driver's licenses are defined, again, my understanding, we're not the agency of jurisdiction, is based on a uh, gross vehicle weight ratio. And the, uh, so depending on what weight class a vehicle falls into, they would need to have a certain class of CDL, either a class B or a Class C. And in addition, because these vehicles carry passengers, they would need uh, a P, what's called a P endorsement. And many of these requirements, as I mentioned in my testimony, are governed by a federal standard that was promulgated by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration uh, and is followed by a uh, majority of states. Now, do, I ne I do either of the agencies or even the NYPD uh, look into whether these drivers possess these licenses? Not at the moment, but I think that's one of the reasons that we uh, made the suggestion that we did for, for your bill, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we think that these companies should be held accountable for uh, only hiring those drivers that are qualified by the appropriate traffic safety agency to operate these vehicles. And if, uh, if they fail that responsibility, uh, our proposal would allow DCA to issue a violation under local law and uh, provided everything in the bills is, is, is written in this manner allow us to consider that violation when we determine whether a license should be issued or renewed. Okay. So when, when a sightseeing bus stop appri applies for a license, do they need to um, request for, for the bus stops before they get the license or show a plan of where they plan on stopping? Not at the moment, but that, again, that's one of the, that's one of the reasons we're looking forward to Speaker Johnson's bill because we think this is going to give, this is going to realign the licensing process so that the requirements for the license more accurately reflect the broader traffic impacts that these vehicles have. And it will give DOT the data and the position and the process that they need to effectively uh, account for those impacts. Now, you testified that you only require for the stops to be reported, not the actual routes. Yeah, that, that's correct. Under the, under the current framework, we're looking just at the curb space that's being requested and whether it can accommodate the proposed bus stop and schedule. Uh, and that has to do with the, all, the, all the criteria discussed, I think, under the proposed legislation. We're excited about sort of further codifying and formalizing those criteria, but it is looking at the use of the curb. That's correct. Okay. Is there a requirement to have a, a, a stop in order to apply for a license? I think there's two questions there. The, the first question is, is it a currently a requirement uh, to have a stop 
in order to apply for the license? The answer is no, but that would be one of the changes that the speaker's bill make and a change that we support. And then the second question there is, uh, are buses required to have a stop in order to use a stop? And I'll uh, pa pass it to my colleagues at DOT for that. In, in order to provide the service and, and have access to the curb, they are required to have a stop uh, that is designated and authorized by DOT. And that, that goes for all of the, basically all of the buses, uh, with some exceptions being some charter bus service for buses that are coming into or circulating within New York City. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Casey, right? You mentioned that the tourists they don't complain. No, they, you you receive very few complaints from the uh, passengers. I'd like to clarify that I was saying that we received uh, no complaints, to my knowledge, about no, an inability no complaints to, at all. Uh, to clarify, uh, no complaints about an, an inability to use the lower level of a, a double-decker sightseeing bus. We do receive complaints from tourists who use these services, uh, though compared to some of our other categories, uh, there are not that many. I believe it was about 80 complaints last year. Yeah. So is is there a requirement? Uh, right now that uh, each bus they have a sign inside, just like the taxi, right? If you have a complaint, you call this number, and this, num this bus number is what, and then this driver is who. Is that, do they have a sign inside the bus? There are, several sign sign there are several signs that are required inside the bus, and we'll be happy to share with you the inspection checklist, which will tell you exactly what our inspectors are looking for when they go out to check a bus. But yes, there are several signs, including one stating a refund policy, which is fairly common across all industries. No, but is this sign posted inside the bus? Inside in, the bus, yes. In there's actually, two, there's actually there's a requirement for posting of two signs at two different locations within the bus. And we can follow up with you about exactly what that looks like when our inspectors go out. So uh, can you also tell me the, the safety record of the sightseeing buses? Like in the last two years, how many accidents have they involved? Sure. So um, with you know, Vision Zero being the overarching principle uh, for a lot of the work we do now at, at DOT, and uh, safety is our first priority, we do track data as best we can on, on sightseeing buses as well as all the other vehicles on the road. Um, looking at New York State DMV injury data, which we have available through 2016, as well as news reports that sort of give you information on, on what's happened and DOT NYPD fatality data that's updated daily. We are aware of, uh, I believe this would be 15 crashes that were involving sightseeing buses dating back to 2005 uh, to today, one of those crashes involving a fatality. I wouldn't have the information on the specifics of each incident uh, in front of me now, but it's something we could look into and also depends on the data source largely. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we have uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer here to testify. It's going to be, uh, her oh, or her, her rep. Sh Sh Shula Warren, the policy director. Whenever you're ready, you can state your name and begin. Thank you. Yep. Um, my name is Shulami Warren Pooter. I'm the policy director for Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify on her behalf. Thank you to Chair Rafael Espinel Jr. for the opportunity to testify today in support of my bill, Intro 725 introduced jointly with council members Margaret Chin and Carlos Machaca. This bill would amend the administrative code of the city to limit the number of sightseeing bus licenses. It has become clear to me in my role as Manhattan Borough President through countless conversations with business owners, residents, and community board members that many in our borough are frustrated with the proliferating sightseeing bus industry. 
According to the New York State Department of Transportation, the number of double-decker sightseeing buses in the city more than tripled from 57 to 194 between 2003 and 2013. The number keeps growing, um, although of course I would also note that I also heard that DCA and DOT testified today that the current number is 197. There is no question that sightseeing bus industry has become a vital component of the tourism industry. However, these hop-on, hop-off sightseeing buses now often operate well below capacity as noted by Councilmember Chin, needlessly contributing to pollution and congestion. Some companies, moreover, disregard predetermined bus stops approved by DOT and drivers will park or idle illegally in MTA bus lanes um, or outside popular tourist destinations like the 9-11 Memorial and Strawberry Fields in Central Park. These problems are the impetus behind intro 725, which would cap the number of sightseeing buses at 225. I've spoken at length to advocates including TWU Local 225, who have concerns that instituting such a cap will result in the loss of jobs. However, no current licenses or jobs will be taken away under this plan. Rather, once the current number of sightseeing bus dips to 225, as it actually currently is, um, no additional licenses would be granted. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to working with members of this committee to ensure proper oversight and enforcement of regulations with respect to the sightseeing bus industry. Thank you for your time. Thank you for testifying. Appreciate it. Send our regards to the board president. Will do. Thank yeah. you so much. I'd like to call up the next panel. We have Patrick Condren of Taxi Tours, Melissa Chapman from the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, Gideon Oliver of Top View, Paul Stewart of Big Bus NYC, and Laura Rothrock from Gray Line NYC. set the clock to three minutes and can you also get a chair for the gentleman thank you gotta go fast yeah feel well Uh, feel free to begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Espinal and committee. My name is Patrick Condren. I represent the Taxi Tours and Big Bus Tours in New York, and I'm giving testimony here on behalf of Charles Nolan, Senior Vice President and General Manager with me today, of Big Bus Tours here in New York. Regarding intro 725A, Big Bus Tours New York is a private bus carrier providing public transport in an urbanized zone. A double-decker bus is the most efficient per passenger mile vehicle in these zones. It is environmentally safe, and we applaud the recent today's and yesterday's efforts of the MTA in New York City Transit to incorporate these same types of buses, or similar types of buses, into the New York City Transit fleet. Being in public transport, it appears inconsistent that intro 728 proposes a cap on the number of double deck buses. Which support? Oh, I beg your pardon. Did that all transmit? Was I loud enough? Would you like me to repeat? Will that re Would you like me to repeat? Okay, so I'll repeat. Good afternoon, Char Chairman Espinal and committee. My name is Patrick Condren. I represent Taxi Tours Incorporated, DBA Big Bus Tours New York. I'm here on behalf and giving testimony on behalf of Charles Nolan. Senior Vice President and General Manager of Big Bus Tours New York. Regarding intro 725A, I bring up that Big Bus Tours New York is a private bus carrier providing public transport in an urbanized zone. A double-decker bus is the most efficient per passenger mile vehicle in these urbanized zones and the most environmentally safe vehicle. We applaud the recent efforts of the New York City Metropolitan Transportation Authority to incorporate these same and similar types of vehicles into the New York City Transit fleet. It happened today and yesterday. 
It appears inconsistent that intro 725A proposes a cap on the number of double-deckers which clearly support congestion mitigation efforts and reduces the footprint. We thank you for consideration of this comment. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Rothrock, and I'm testifying on behalf of Twin America, Gray Line City Sightseeing, New York. Regarding intro 289A, Twin is opposed to this legislation. Twin America has implemented automated tour guide technology to provide tour-related information to its riders. In large part, this change in methodology occurred as a result of the 2010 legislation requiring headphone-limited sound reproduction systems that you mentioned before. While Twin America still uses live tour guides for some of its services, that decision is discretionary with Twin America and is determined based on Twin America's sound business judgment. Legislation should not be promoted as a substitute for this. The Council now seeks to implement legislation to require licensed tour guides to be utilized on the upper level of all tour buses. That certainly seems duplicative of the services already provided. And to the extent the concern is one of safety regarding disruption to the drivers, we question why the individual that is required to be on the upper level of the bus is required to be a licensed tour guide. We note that in the original draft of the proposed bill, there was no license requirement, only an employee was required. Safety concerns could be addressed in that manner. Lastly, we do not believe any mandate regarding personnel on the buses is necessary. Again, this should be left to the company. Twin America is proud of its driver training and safety record. They will continue to be diligent in the pursuit of the very best and safe experience for its customers. Intro 723 allows for community boards to comment on a sightseeing bus stop application that is pending before the DOT. While Twin America supports and welcomes the participation of community boards, we believe a collaborative effort is required. And I'm just going to summarize. We respectfully request that the bill be amended to allow for the applicant to respond to a community board's and the DOC's concerns following the 45-day comment period and that the, a period of true discourse follow. At present, the DOT may approve or reject an applicant's proposed stops without any justification. So we would like to work together with all interests to craft the best solution. Regarding 725, Twin America supports the limitation of the number of, bice, of bus licenses with the below proviso. We support the portion of the bill which protects the number of licenses already in commerce. However, the language in the bill ties the city license to the license plate and not the number of licensed buses. When Twin America replaces a bus in its fleet, a new license for that bus is issued. That situation is not protected in the current bill, only the renewal of the same license is provided. In the event an operator turns in a license because an older bus is replaced for a newer, more efficient vehicle, the operator is in jeopardy of not obtaining a license because the total number of licenses may be exceeded. This language as drafted actually provides a disincentive for operators to upgrade their fleets to a more fuel efficient technology because they risk not obtaining a license for the new vehicle. Therefore, we strongly suggest current DCA licenses be grandfathered in based on the company's current number of licenses issued and not the actual plate. Regarding intro 727, which outlines the lic licensing requirements for drivers, we support this legislation and we already take a lot of these steps and heightened precautions and we thank you for your consideration. Good afternoon, Chair Espinal, committee members and guests. I'm Melissa Chapman, Senior Vice President for Public Affairs at the Brooklyn Chamber, and I'm delivering testimony on behalf of our President and CEO, Andrew Hone. We're very grateful for this opportunity to provide feedback on the four bills being considered in an effort to increase regulation for the sightseeing bus industry. While we agree that safety comes first in these considerations, we are concerned that additional regulation may put limitations on bus operators, which would in turn hinder, hinder the growth of tourism in New York City. The Brooklyn Chamber is a leading advocate for increased tourism in Brooklyn. In 2014, we launched Explore Brooklyn, the borough's dedicated tourism website featuring a complete source of places to eat, events, shopping, and attraction. We have since formed an Explore Brooklyn Tourism and Hospitality Committee with the goal of leading tourism efforts and initiatives as well as closing the needs gap within the tourism industry. I will now out outline our position on each bill. Intro 289, rightly so, this bill aims to increase passenger safety by keeping the tour operator and bus driver roles separate in the hopes of reducing driver 
distraction which can lead to accidents. However, the reality is that while this provision is well-intentioned, it will increase the cost of sightseeing bus operating companies, especially smaller ones. To this end, we encourage our legislators and the City Council to pass a resolution that would help to create additional incentives for these companies should this bill become law. Such action would make our streets safer while providing operators with the resources that they need to adapt to increased overhead expenses. Intro 723, under this proposed legislation, operators on street stop bus plans would be subject to a 45-day notice and comment period before the local community board. This would present an administrative challenge for bus operators, especially if they would like to alter standard stops for the purpose of creating customized itineraries for corporate conventions and other specialty groups. While well-meaning, our determination is that the public notice and comment period is lengthy and could impede much-needed business opportunities for operators. In cases where bus operators may need to change established routes, our recommendation is that their application be reviewed by the uh, Department of Transportation, who could then issue a special variance within 10 business days to the bus operator, provided uh, that the plan changes will not pose any threats to safety. Intro 725, if enacted, this provision will limit the number of license plates in our city to 225. In places such as Brooklyn, where the tourism industry is still relatively young, putting a cap on the number of license plates will have a negative effect on the tourism and business, and tourism and business development. As a tourism advocate, the Brooklyn Chamber always welcomes additional opportunities for tourists to cross the bridge and shop at our local establishments. Sightseeing bus operators are, key, are a key element in increasing tourism in the outer boroughs and imposing a cap would inhibit uh, progress being made. As the committee alluded to earlier, probably creating incentives for uh, more, more buses in, in the outer boroughs would be a good approach. Um, and then just to wrap up, um, we agree with most of the uh, provisions in 727, but would just uh, require probably a review of the, of the uh, provision where it states that the, the, bus, the bus driver's um, list must be, pro must be submitted every time a new bus driver is hired or leaves. Uh, we pro um, recommended that that be done probably on a semi-annual basis. And uh, just to wrap up, we um, look forward to working with this committee to create a balance between um, tourism growth and uh, safety in our city. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share the, uh, this feedback with you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gideon Oliver. Uh, I'm uh, going to summarize a uh, testimony that I hope uh, the council members already have in front of them which is a 12-page uh, letter from Aston Kostadinov, the president of Top View. I'm just going to read it verbatim. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, I'm going to very briefly summarize some of the main points. There's about three pages uh, of uh, uh, specific comments as to each of the intros. Um, with respect to 289A, um, like Twin America, uh, Top View uses automated uh, GPS-driven uh, systems to give tours to, in order to hire um, separate licensed tour guides to uh, occupy the top of the um, <coughs> uh, of their buses it would cost a great deal of money, it would over a million dollars a year, um, and in fact, I think well over a million dollars a year. Um, and the return on that cost would be um, relatively no to nothing, as far as we can see. Um, uh, I think there are some flaws in the logic behind the proposal. Um, for instance, it, it assumes distractions. Uh, are driving accidents and not other um, uh, causes, et cetera. Uh, there's some more comments on that point uh, in the letter. Um, as to 725 and the cap, um, we oppose the cap. Um, there are serious problems, I think, um, with imposing a cap in terms of the possibility of recreating some of the market conditions that led to the antitrust litigation um, uh, that only settled a few years ago. Um, certainly, if there is going to be a, a cap that's imposed, um, uh, we suggest that it should be imposed based on real data and information. The number 225 doesn't seem to come um, from uh, uh, data or information, at least that we've had access to or been able to uh, have a conversation um, about. Uh, so, so we have those concerns. Um, uh, I'm not sure that there is a connection between the ads um, on the buses and the congestion. Um, and I'm sure that. Um, uh, uh, industry stakeholders would be happy to engage in conversations and share information about 
um, uh, you know, some of the concerns that have been raised today and that have been raised in the past. Um, I, I'm not sure that there has been a, a flow of information that way, but I, I think there certainly could be. And um, finally, on 720, we do have comments on 723, but I'm going to focus on 727. Um, I want to correct an error on page 11 of the uh, testimony. Um, we, we agree that reporting within a, uh, accidents or uh, traffic infractions within a business day is a requirement that um, makes sense. Um, but there are, we do have concerns about what exactly should be reported. Um, specifically, having the business report who may have been at fault within a business day before there's been invest an investigation, um, before there's been a police report, um, as an insurance claim is just beginning to be pending, and certainly in cases where there are traffic infractions or uh, situations where drivers are issued summonses or there's some kind of legal process going on, there are other concerns that are implicated that, that, there. That point was actually removed from the bill. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, um, I see my time is up, and uh, I'll rely on the remainder of the 12 pages of uh, comments. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Yes, good afternoon, council members, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Stewart, and I'm speaking in support of Safety Law Intro 289A, the bill that would require at least one licensed tour guide atop double-decker buses. I've been a licensed tour guide with Big Bus New York City for approximately two years. There are two main functions that I serve in my role as tour guide. Number one, to provide a safe environment for passengers visiting my great city, and number two, to provide an extraordinary experience for the thousands who ride my buses every year. Today, I will focus my remarks on the former of the two. Double-decker buses in the fleet have a seating capacity of at least 55 seats upstairs and 28 downstairs. So at any given time, I'm responsible for up to 83 passengers. And since these buses are hop on, hop off, you can see how the number of passengers service can add up during any given day. At the beginning of the tour, I announced the two big bus rules, number one. Nobody stands while the bus is in motion. I repeat this rule for emphasis. And number two, please do not extend your arms, elbows, head, or selfie sticks over the side of the bus. And since some passengers either are listening to one of the language translations or just not at all, I make a point to approach them, coach children on how they should sit, how they should sit so, which is facing forward, or use structural language to keep everyone seated. Everyone on board is watching me enforce these rules without exception. So riders get, they really get that I take my safe, their safety seriously. So far my diligence has resulted in no major incidents on my watch. However, there have been quite a few near misses. Many times passengers are having such a great time taking in the sights that they forget the little things, like watching their children. The other day, a child left her seat to search for a drop item on the floor. I immediately grabbed the child's shoulders, repositioned her properly, and instructed the parent to keep the child seated. Some five seconds later, the driver slammed his foot on the brakes to avoid a yellow cab crossing his path. That child could have sustained serious injury if I hadn't acted quickly, and would likely have been injured if there were no tour guide on board the bus at that time. Passengers on board actually applauded my actions. Please pass safety law intro 289A. Thank you for listening to my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question that I have, um, I believe that one of the bills uh, asks for the companies to uh, submit their GPS data to the city. How, does the, how do the companies feel about that, or the industry? Um, Twin America, we're fine with sharing our data. Okay. Big bus says as well. Same for top view. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just have one question that I'm very curious about. Uh, when when uh, Council Chen introduced the bill on the cap, uh, there were 237 buses on our streets. We've now seen reports that there are only 197 buses. Can anyone explain on why there was such a significant drop off? I'm pleased to report in recent years I advised Borough President Gail Brewer at different times that um, Skyline stopped operating and the passengers were then taken care of by big bus tours. A year later, Open Loop, just last last 12 months, stopped operating and big bus tours and other companies uh, have started picking up their, um, their passengers. So what we're doing is maximum utilization of equipment and seating at this time. So there has actually been a consolidation and it's a normal 
bell curve cycle in transportation, tour and travel related hospitality focus of industry curves. And similar to what happened in London as well. All right. Councilman? I, I guess my question to the, the, the company is like big bus tour. How many licenses do you have? How many buses do you operate? In January and February, we were putting, uh, the licensed buses in, included 64, uh, but we were putting 32 and 33 on the road. Now after Easter, we're approaching peak periods, as in any transit operation, you have peak periods, and uh, we're approaching that level on the tour and travel side now. So your peak period is about 60, 64. 64? 64, which will be more um, after Memorial Day to, Memorial Day to Labor Day is the peak period. Uh, Do you go to the other boroughs? Pardon? We go to Brooklyn, and we have we have been talking with Queens and Staten Island and, and the Bronx. And also, I, I noticed that Big Bus, you don't, I don't think you have advertisement on the we side of the bus. We have limited advertising on our buses. Some of that is a residual of the integration of some of the other companies I just mentioned, uh, the chairman that had commitments for advertising contracts. Therefore, the advertising contract continued on a minimal number of buses. You are correct, Councilman Chin, thank you. So you have, you have uh, customers on the, hmm? the, the lower level? I'm sorry, say that again? I mean, you have customers sitting that on the lower level. Yes, yes. Because I've you seen your bus going we, by. You don't have those. Uh, we, we're pleased to say we're, um, we're carrying a lot, of, you know, a lot of people. For Twin America, how many buses, thank you. For Twin America, how many buses do you have the license? Uh, we have 93 licenses, but similar to Big Bus, it depends on the time of the year and the weather. Um, it's very weather dependent as far as how many buses are in operation. We have 23 licenses. 23 licenses and you have I'm sorry, 93 licenses. Yeah. And 93 plates. Um, I'm not sure about the number of actual buses. But 93 yeah. buses are at the, at the height. Licenses, yeah. <laughs> so do your bus, does your bus carry those uh, advertisement on the side that covers so the we do, side of the bus? We do have um, the wrapped buses, the oh, advertising buses, on okay. some of our buses, but the technology allows for you to see through the window even when it's wrapped. So you still are able to see. Um, if you're sitting on the lower level. But it's not that clear though. I mean, it's something, it's not I mean, as we're, clear we're, as you're welcome to come. your view, right? <laughs> well, people prefer, if it's a nice day, to sit on the upper deck, I think, whether or not there's advertising on the windows, but you can see through those windows. Um, I remember you testifying last time, but I don't think I got the data from you. Do you have any information about the advertising dollars that you generate um, wrapping around those buses? Um, we, that's information that I don't have available today. I'm sure the company has that information. I just would need to speak to them if they would be willing to disclose it. That would be great if you can bring it back. I hope they will. Um, top view, how many buses do you you know, I, I don't have that information sitting here um, uh, right off the top of my head. Um, 25. Yes, I do. 25. 25. 25? Correct, Your Honor. Uh, yes. But what's, yes, Councilwoman. Sorry. But the name, the name doesn't honoring. say top view, though, because I, I, don't, I don't remember seeing top view sightseeing buses. It, 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 does say, it does say top view, Your Honor. And, and I agree. You can see out of the, I, I think you can see quite well out of the lower level. I, I, I would invite all the council members to you know, go and see for, for yourselves how well you could see out of the lower level. And I don't know, I mean, you if can't people, see, yeah. You can't see in though, so if you're looking outside the bus, you, you know, you might be assuming that the lower level is not being used when in fact it is being utilized. So do you have uh, the, the amount of dollars that you have, gener advertising dollars that you've generated by those your wraparound advertisement on your bus? I, I don't have that sitting here today, but, but I'd be happy to follow up. Can you, okay. We'll, we'll get back to you on that. Yes, sir. May I inject? Um, on a personal and professional basis, I'll preface that I've been in the motor coach and tour and travel on bus business since 1964 when I was in high school. So with a lifelong experience, I will tell you that in transit, tour and travel, 
the revenue that's generated from advertising, similar to the MTA, New Jersey Transit, and most private carriers throughout the New York metropolitan area, is part of general revenue that gets contributed to the pool to operate the company, therefore keeping you know, fares at a level uh, point. Big Bus, in particular, as you pointed out, Councilwoman, um, has a minimal number, but it still is part of the revenue stream. So it contributes to the general revenue of the company. Well, one of the biggest concerns among my constituents and New Yorkers is that you have these rolling billboards, you know, and it's like polluting the air, uh, and they're not being fully utilized, So, and they're clogging up our streets. I, I agree. There's 5,370 New York City transit buses that the revenue also generates to help our transit system, and we're all part of that public transport system. I... I don't agree with you on that. I mean, uh, that's why we're looking at uh, finding a balance, you know. I mean, we welcome the tourists, and they can, they can walk around I, the neighborhood. They can get off and really enjoy the site. New York but City. when you have empty bus or buses just carrying, you know, a handful of people uh, just roaming down the street every couple of minutes, it's not a pleasant sight. No disagreements, and specifically on that, oftentimes that case is in a discussion with uh, Borough President Brewer at different times. I've explained and, and invited her to see, and, and you may have seen it, that the people are actually then inside the Empire State Building or going over to the Statue of Liberty. You know, they're not always on the bus, they're in between. And this is an empty seat reflects somebody having gotten on and gotten off, because the majority of the vehicles in New York City, as you demonstrated, Chairman, by the numbers of 62 million people coming to New York City, are full buses when they start in Midtown for the most part. So if I may just go back to the other part in, 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 in New York City, we are a world-class city. And I recall being in the tour and travel business in Times Square in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, and nobody wanted to come. Now, we have people coming. We're fortunate to have that system. But other cities, which is Boston, Paris, Rome, Hong Kong, Singapore, take your pick, they welcome and integrate tour and travel, tourism-related buses into the system. And I would invite you to consider that very important thought process. And I recognize that I noticed a testimony today by the partnership, and I'm going to reach out to uh, Kathy Wild to ask her to collaborate that we could determine and identify the exact amount of money that we've asked that an average tourist tourist person does bring into the city of New York. We know what the NYC and company projects, right? Which is $2,642 or some such thing. I, well, I we're, looking, all those we're details. looking forward to getting the information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's call up the next panel. And excuse me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Jane Waterdurg. Christine Berthet. Devin Cipher. Cynthia Chapin and Peter Davies. Whenever you're ready, you may begin your testimony. Whoever you like to. You have to hit the microphone. Yeah. Is that on? I'm sorry. I live in Soho on Broadway, and I, can't, I look out the window and see these double-decker buses every day. And also, I live at the corner of Broadway and Broome, where there's pollution from the Holland Tunnel, in addition, and gridlock, in addition to the bus exhaust. And I rarely see a bus that even has 33% capacity on the top. Usually, it's 10% or even less, sometimes, you know, four to six people. So, uh, and they're one after another. And I'm supporting um, this effort by 
Councilmember Chin and Gail Brewer to limit the number of buses, but I uh, think that it would be better to have a lower cap on the number, even lower. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Espinal and members of the Council. I am here today on behalf of Jessica Lappin, President of the Downtown Alliance, um, the Business Improvement District for Lower Manhattan. We serve an area roughly from City Hall to the Battery, from the East River to, the West, to West Street. Our annual meeting is this afternoon, and Jessica regrets that she was in, unable to attend in person. I am here to testify in support of intros 289, 723, 725, and 727, and to offer some suggestions to make them stronger. As the city's oldest neighborhood and home to an array of attractions, we have seen an increasing number of sightseeing buses throughout our district over the last number of years. This increase in volume is a mixed blessing. Over the last decade, Lower Manhattan's tourism industry has been expanding very rapidly. By the end of 2016, we had 14.8 million visitors, and we anticipate this number will continue to grow. We are heartened to see the City Council tackling some of the challenges presented by the tourism growth by imposing sensible limits on the number of sightseeing bus licenses, giving the Department of Transportation an increased role on the number of site, uh, sorry, as a regulatory agency, and integrating community board input into operator plans. And while regulation of sightseeing buses is laudable, we strongly believe these regulations should also apply to charter buses. Over the course of a recent week-long study or survey conducted by the Alliance, we found over 200 charter buses, including almost 100 unique bus companies, either improperly loading and unloading passengers or idling within the district. Not only do these buses create sidewalk crowding wherever they let passengers on and off, but they also exacerbate street congestion by idling, blocking bus lanes, and increasing traffic. Add the already high volume of pedestrians, bicycles, and other vehicles competing for space, as well as downtown's sizable residential and worker populations to the mix, and the immediate need for better regulation of these buses becomes even clearer as their impact on public safety and quality of life increases. The city needs to address the root cause of congestion and improve pedestrian safety by regulating this industry in tandem with increased enforcement. The provisions in these bills are a strong step in the right direction. We believe the bills can be improved with certain modifications and we re request that you consider these changes. One, modify language to more clearly define what constitutes a sightseeing bus and consider extending the definition to include charter buses. Two, for intro 289, consider specifying the maximum amount of time all employees are permitted to work to ensure they do not combine their upper, upper level shift with the driving shift, similar to the 12 hour maximum for drivers as stipulated in intro 727. Uh, further, consider lowering the 12 hour maximum for driver shifts to 10 hours. This number should be consistent with all federal safety standards and guidelines. Should I keep going? <laughs> um, for intro 725, devise a clear process for assigning licenses, especially once the limit has been reached. For intro 723, consider an intermediate penalty of a suspension versus a revoca revocation of a sightseeing bus stop approval. For intro 727, modify language to outline enforcement criteria for the city, such as random checks or requiring display of driver's commercial licenses. Um, thank you again for your attention to this issue. We look forward to working with the council on these bills and to continue making Lower Manhattan safer and more welcoming to New Yorkers and those who come to visit from all over the world. My name is Devin Cipher, and I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be alive. On July 3rd, 2015, I was run over by a double-decker tour bus while I was crossing 6th Avenue in Greenwich Village. There's a traffic video showing me on 6th Avenue in the crosswalk on a green light. There's another traffic video showing the driver of the bus speeding through a stop sign on West 4th Street before plowing into me head on. And there's a video on YouTube showing a river of my blood flowing down 6th Avenue. As I rolled under the bus's wheels, I remember feeling grateful. Grateful that my head was not under the wheels. I spent three months in the ICU at Bellevue Hospital having multiple surgeries. The bus driver got a new job within weeks, driving another tour bus. 
The thing about traffic crashes is that they don't discriminate. Everyone is at risk, regardless of race, class, religion, or sexual orientation. Every person in this room is at risk the moment you step out of this building. And trust me, none of you want to endure what I've gone through. It took two months before I could stand. I had open wounds for more than a year. I still wear a brace on my leg. I go to physical therapy twice a week, and I suffer from neuropathic pain that feels like someone is trying to cut off my toes with piano wire. And I'm one of the lucky crash victims. Please pass legislation regulating sightseeing buses. Please make sure drivers are vetted. And please don't allow drivers whose licenses have been revoked or suspended even once. The driver who ran me over did not get his license suspended. He didn't even get ticketed despite the video evidence. Tickets are rarely given for maiming or even killing pedestrians and bicyclists. Setting the bar as low as proposed for professional, professional drivers is an insult and a threat to every person who steps into the city. You have their lives and the lives of the yos you hold dear in your hands. I have remained grateful throughout this experience. I truly hope that I can leave here today feeling grateful to all of you for the work that you are doing to make New York a safer and even more glorious city. Thank you for your time. Well, my name is Christine Verte. I am the co-founder of CheckPed, the Pedestrian Safety Coalition. On the west side of Manhattan, our district includes Chelsea, the High Line, 8th Avenue, and Times Square, which have all experienced a high concentration of tour buses. We applaud the introduction of this batch of legislation to improve safety, reduce congestion, with the following suggestion. Intro 723, which provide a process criteria for bus to be granted by DOT. Today on West 42nd Street, sighting bus stops are often located and granted by DOT in MTA bus stop and on dedicated bus lanes, significantly slowing down the system. We recommend that the legislation explicitly cite public transportation as a criteria to be considered along traffic. No sightseeing bus should stop should ever be located in an MTA bus or in an MTA bus lane. The community board should be given 60 days to review application as is customary. 45 days is not feasible and equivalent to silencing the community. The legislation should explicitly request that buses use truck routes only as they are the only one permitted for, for buses and therefore the, the route should be really controlled. I'll skip the next two ones which uh, you can read and I want to concentrate on what Council Member Chin is talking about, about the fact that many of the tour buses that cruise around seem to be fulfilling the advertising contracts more than facilitating visits. Uh, I think it may be useful to request that all buses be equipped with real windows downstairs and not obstructed by anything, and then limit the footprint of the advertisement they carry. Uh, the city zoning limits the size of advertisement in the city. And so I don't see any reason and, and on taxis, there is a limit on the size of advertisement. I don't see any reason why those buses shouldn't be subject to a limit size of advertisement. And if there is advertisement, the license should be proportional to the size of the advertisement. So we can at least share for the benefit. Um, and in intro number 727, I will second what uh, this speaker has said. I mean, the thought that the driver who had their driver license suspended or revoked once in the last five years would still be driving is appalling. You know, in order to have your license suspended or revoked, it means that you have had many, many, many infractions first. And as you can hear, if you nearly kill somebody, you don't get an infraction in this country. So I think that this, this level is too, uh, too flexible and it should be, if you are going to give responsibility for 50 or 60 people to a driver, that driver should have an impeccable record. Thank you so much for hearing us. Good afternoon, my name is Pete Davies. I live on Broadway and Soho. I'm here on behalf of the Broadway Residents Coalition in support of the legislation to strengthen controls on the double-decker tourist buses. This industry is insufficiently regulated, but it's highly lucrative. They pay a maximum of $100 per bus for a two-year permit. 
I would be interested to hear from them since they're still here, maybe you could ask them back up, how that balances out their cost to the city as opposed to the revenue they bring in. I'm sure they probably pay taxes on their income. Is that taxes, do they pay taxes on the advertising revenue? Is that linked? They're, um, the biggest company is from London and Paris. International Corporation that's decided New York is a great place to do business and we're making it pretty easy for them. These big buses clog our streets. The upcoming L train shutdown, as Margaret has pointed out, is bringing dozens of transit buses into our neighborhood and will further exacerbate our already congested area. The council has one year to address the interconnected problems of tourist buses and transit buses. Now is the time to act. And now is the time for the Department of Consumer Affairs, who I'm very sorry have left the room because there's a lot of this that they should be addressing, to enforce the rules already in place for these impactful buses. And now is also the time for the DCA to take action on a related problem, the many mobile food vending trucks that jostle for position with these tourist buses for curb space, making our Soho sidewalks impassable and pushing pedestrians into the street. Chair Espinal. I ask you to use your position to address the current failure of enforcement. Councilmember Chin, I, connecting to this hell train shutdown, I ask you to work with the other council members to push the DCA to fulfill its mandate to protect our quality of life and to demand that DOT share information with downtown residents on what they have planned for us. And to Speaker Johnson, I ask him to use his power of his position to call for the needed oversight of this industry. Constituents downtown need protections from an out of control and highly impactful double-decker tourist bus industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and, and thank you Devin for coming and sharing your testimony. Um, your instance is what I think drove me to want to have these hearings so thank you for being here. Who is here with TWU? Raise your hands. And who is here with the Tour Guide Association? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So I'm guessing you're all going to speak on, on the same issue and all show support for, for the bills. Is there anyone who wants to play ambassador to everyone? Because we do have like 20 people who want to testify. Play the ambassador of the organizations? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, c come up. Let the leaders of the organizations please come up. And thank you all for being here today. Just when you're ready to begin, uh, state your name clearly before your testimony, that we can keep record, and the organization you're with. Good afternoon, Chairman Espinal, and uh, I thank you for this time before the committee. My name is Michael Dillinger. I am a licensed New York City tour guide and president of the Guides Association of New York City, and we ask for your support of 289A. 
My colleagues can attest to the events that occur on the tops of double-decker buses. I would like to provide a bit more context as to why guides are the best choice regarding safety. Guides spend more time actively engaged with our city's visitors than any other New Yorkers they may encounter. The relationship between guide and visitor is interactive. We are not a canned voice rattling off facts and figures. We are not a driver or customer service agent there to merely check tickets and make a periodic safety announcement to people overwhelmed by the sensory overload many of them experience in our bustling metropolis. As ambassadors for our city, we are constantly focused on the guest's experience, helping to interpret the city via the tour. We monitor the travel's reactions as we direct their attention to various elements of the neighborhoods visited. And because we narrate area, the areas traveled through, we are keenly aware of changes along the route that may give rise to unexpected safety concerns. The very nature of our work as guides keeps us actively engaged with travelers for the duration of their journey on the buses. We want to help people fall in love with New York City, and their safety is a crucial part of that. And I'd just like to add, as the Guides Association of New York City, we would be happy to be a resource to you for any of the issues regarding tourism in the city that come before the committee. Thank you. How do I start the re? Okay. Okay. I'm Judy Richheimer. I am representing actually two organizations, the Chelsea Reform Democratic Club, or CRDC, as well as the Guides Association of New York City, where I am chair of the Government Relations Committee. And uh, Council Member Espinal, you may recall that our committee met with you to discuss the very issue of ads on the outside of buses. It was not a revenue issue so much for us is that we just did not want our tourists to be seeing New York City through a window darkly with, you know, ads obscuring the city. Um, thank you, Council Member Espinal and committee members for hearing us today. CRDC strongly supports Intro 289 as an intelligent safety measure that has the added benefit of retaining and creating well-paying jobs. Gannick recognizes that while double-decker touring provides a wonderful introduction to our city, it is potentially dangerous. And the only way to offset that danger is to have, in addition to the driver, a responsible party on board. And for several reasons, that responsible party must be a licensed tour guide. Tour guides have proven themselves not only as entertainers and educators, but also of, as protectors of their customers' well-being. They know how to keep an eye out for double-decker passengers who, for example, are so enthusiastic about being here in New York, they have trouble staying in their seats while the bus is in motion. And once the tour guide spots that risky behavior, the guide knows what to do, that is, handle it with firmness and, if possible, humor, too. We all have war stories about customers whose enthusiasm was really difficult to tamp down. Mine took place some 20 years ago involving a man taking photos while leaning so far over the upper deck rail he was jackknifed against its outer side. The man spoke only German, I deployed a few shoulder taps and some bitters, please, and then I escalated to Achtung. No response. Luckily, this odd form of picture taking had begun while the bus was at rest. But once the engine revved up, I had no choice but to get behind him, grab his belt, and then yank the man up before he fell onto the sidewalk. Incidentally, he was well over six feet and appeared to weigh about 250 pounds or more, so the pedestrian below, as well as the tourist on top, was at risk. You will likely hear other cases where extreme intervention was required, mainly though by continually stating safety reminders. The guide ensures that those instances are rare. Either way, it is unlikely that just any bus company employee would zealously protect passengers as we guides do. We know that the driver cannot and should not constantly mon monitor the top deck, and it is certain that a recorded narration would never reach out and prevent a passenger from falling onto the sidewalk. Please pass 289A to help keep our customers and our city safe. 
Thank you. Can you please also again state your name for the record? I'm, I'm state, sorry. Your state name. your name for oh, the record. Oh, uh, Judy Richheimer. Thank you. My name is Andy Cedor, and I've been a New York City tour guide for almost 20 years. About half that time was spent working on double-decker buses, and most of that time I was a union representative of workers in that industry. A number of times over those years, I have testified in these very chambers for the need for common sense legislation to ensure the presence of licensed tour guides on double-decker buses. We gather guides to tell you the true tales of near disasters that we have prevented through experience, knowledge, and professionalism. My own story recalls a time heading up First Avenue by Stuytown where someone hurled a ball of ice at the bus, striking a passenger in the face so hard it drew blood. While signaling the driver to keep moving so as to vacate the danger, I was able to help the passenger. Since I knew hospitals were coming up, I could offer to take him to an emergency room. He declined. But these are things that really only a professional guy would know to do. But I've told this story before, over a decade ago, when Phil Reed was the head of this committee. Legislation was all set to go, but the council then yielded to the industry, pleading with them to withdraw in exchange for an unwritten promise not to run buses without guides on them. Well, that promise has been broken, and the industry is pushing its luck, running more and more buses without guides. A fatal accident is becoming inevitable. But maybe that's what you want, because frankly, I've been fighting for years to get this council to act responsibly, gathering dozens of true accounts of lives saved and accidents averted. But I feel as if you really wish you had a corpse on a bus, the very thing we guys work so diligently to prevent, then you can act responsibly? Now, there was 10 years ago not one but two fatal accidents down in D.C. on double-decker buses. The city should have acted then, but failed again. Is this city going to repeat that failure again? Because should you not act now and wait for things to get worse rather than prevent these things from happening in the first place, the story is not going to be about a heroic council taking action because this guy is going to show how you could have acted and did not. This incarnation of the council can and should pass 289A. And while I still got some time on the thing, if you have questions about how the windows work and stuff like that, uh, or DCA, whether they take complaints or not, you could ask me that, that but and that'll yield to the next person. Thank you, Chairman Espinal, Council Member Chin, uh, for the honor of addressing you. My name is Leonel Hamanaka, a native New Yorker. I'm an Upper West Side resident raised on the Lower East Side in Harlem. I'm a tour guide on a hop-on, hop-off bus and a member of TWU Local 100 and the Guides Association of New York City. I had the privilege of helping an elderly lady who, on a double-decker who had missed a step on the stairway. I waited with her family for an ambulance so she could receive medical care. Our company gave us safety training on buses, how to turn on the emergency brake in case it rolls or the driver has a heart attack, and we have a first aid kit on every bus. My first concern is to provide a safe ride through New York because an accident ruins a tour. The bus stops, 90 people have to get off, the patient must be comforted, medical care obtained, and they may face expensive uninsured treatment costs. Of course I want to give a good tour where people have a good time, but the officer, uh, a bus operator has blind spots on the second level. He actually cannot see. Uh, tour guides can see 360 degrees on top and help the driver avoid potential accidents. Uh, if what just happened in Canada yesterday happened here on the second level of a double-decker, by the time the driver realized what was going on, it would be too late. Passengers don't know. Double-deckers have special Westinghouse brakes that, when slammed unexpectedly, can throw them off their feet. They also don't know that they can fall off the side of the bus, that if they stand up, they could be hit by traffic lights or street signs or injure a limb on the staircase. Right here across the street in front of 250, uh, one block down, there is a street sign hanging down with about 250 wads of gum on it. Now, if the passengers on the top level of a double-decker can reach up and put the bubble gum there, if they really stood up, they could get their head knocked off. Uh, I'm sorry to say. I'm constantly watching and preventing risky behavior. When it rains or snows, I make sure passengers take their ponchos off downstairs because if they're left upstairs, they can 
fall onto the uh, windshield of a passing car. As we speak, there are double-deckers driving over bridges to Brooklyn, and parts of the Manhattan Bridge have no railing. And Bronx, with, uh, Bronx also, uh, with tourists standing up to take photos, and nobody on the second level. This is, not, of course, not our company. This is an accident waiting to happen. I advocate for Interim 289 as the best way to prevent accidents and protect neighborhoods and the passengers we welcome to our beloved New York City. Good afternoon. My name is Rick Stoneback. I've been a uh, New York City tour guide since 1981. I've worked in three double-decker companies uh, over the last 19 years, and I'm here to advocate uh, for having licensed tour guides on the tops of double-decker buses. I think it's incredibly important to have someone who is trained properly and who is licensed by the Department of Consumer Affairs. I've had, and I've been one of the lucky ones, I've had two cases where I have literally saved passengers physically from either a serious injury or death by literally jumping onto them and pulling them down by their shoulders into their seats. Uh, and countless times for verbal warnings when I see people starting to stand or moving, trying to go up and down the steps of a moving double-decker bus is incredibly treacherous. And I know that in the past there have been representatives who have not been licensed who have had these jobs working for minimum wage who basically spend much of their time uh, checking Facebook when they're driving around on a double-decker bus. We do, like Michael said, engage directly with our passengers nonstop. Now, I think another thing that we have to review, too, is the importance of a tour guide to really the increased revenue of the city of New York, which is very important. You cannot get this with a recorded tour. We offer suggestions. We're constantly being pummeled with questions from tourists. We give advice on restaurants, on Broadway shows, on museums, on hotels, on any kind of attraction in the city that you can imagine. And when people come to the city, as so many do, I don't have to tell you the numbers who come in, we are there to help them have the best experience possible so that when they go home, they're more likely to return and they're more likely to tell their friends and their family to also visit New York City. It's a very important part of our industry here in New York. Regarding the, um, the advertisements on the, the bus windows, I have to tell you, as opposed to some of the people who have testified today, I spend my day on those buses. Uh, and I can tell you that the advertisements do inhibit views from the buses, especially on a day that's not sunny, you can see next to nothing. Now, it's very, very difficult to uh, what, what you uh, mentioned, Council and Chin, about the numbers of people on any given bus. Um, we run a, a steady schedule, like every 10, 20 minutes, so we can never be sure of how many people are going to be on a bus at every given moment. Uh, that's always uh, something that's impossible for us to figure out when people are going to be getting on the bus at the different stops as we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, you're, you're free to go. <laughs> um, well, that, that concludes our hearing. Oh, so, yeah, come up, come up, sorry. Yeah, I just hit the button. Hit, hit the button. The button on the. Oh, hit the button. Okay. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi.
Good, af good afternoon. Um, my name is Linda DeRosa, and I'm from uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Park Community Advisory Council in Brooklyn. And um, I'm, firstly, I'm sorry that Councilman Landers wasn't here for the entire um, testimony today, since you know we wanted to make sure Brooklyn is represented. Um, so the advisory council comprises uh, organizations which surround Brooklyn Bridge Park who were impacted by park activities since the park began to open venues in, I think, like 2007 and 2008. Um, so firstly, impacted is an understatement. The, um, the amount of tour buses that arrive and depart around Brooklyn, especially our neighborhoods, which comprise of Dumbo, Fulton Ferry Landing, Brooklyn Heights, and the Atlantic Avenue corridor are the, amount, the volume is just overwhelming and it becomes more and more overwhelming every year as park, the park continues to develop. And um, I was surprised to hear that there's uh, 197 tour buses because I work in Midtown by um, the Empire State Building and live in sort of this new uh, happening area of Brooklyn and it just seems like it's an overwhelming uh, situation already. So I thank you for your work and your, uh, your advocacy for regulations for these double-decker tour buses. Um, also, the neighborhoods on, uh, that we represent in Brooklyn are filled with narrow streets, narrow cobblestone streets, uh, which were never meant for the volume of any cars, let alone the amount of tour buses that are now trying to navigate around the neighborhood. So we um, absolutely agree that tour bus licenses should be uh, capped. I hope that that's something that can be done. Before designated tour bus stops are um, located, they really should be closely evaluated and monitored, and more importantly, that there should be enforcement of the bus stops, because as we see now, um, in our particular area, the 84th Precinct is trying to monitor the buses along Old Fulton Street and um, Furman Street, and it's just overwhelming. I mean, I, I give props to the police, but they, they can't handle it because there's no really set designated um, rules and laws that seem to be followed. So, uh, and also in our particular case, and I guess we can follow up with Councilman uh, Landers on this, uh, we would like Brooklyn Bridge Park to be involved which the, and held accountable, which they have not been to date. The council is doing this on their own without a representative of the, of the park here, which is frankly a shame. So thank you, and as far as our committee goes, we would love to be involved in any way we can to help you make decisions and improve the situation. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think we also have one more, Terry, Terry Kuhn. Yep. Thank you. Uh, hi, good afternoon, and thank you for is the, holding. Is the button on, the red button? It is. All right, great. Hello. Thank you for holding this hearing, and um, Community Board 2 has done several resolutions, most of which are very much in favor of the package of legislation before you. Um, I've personally spoken to Council Member Chin's legislation favorably. We would like to see controls on tour buses. We, in the area that Community Board 2 serves, are overwhelmed, as I'm sure you've heard from others who have testified. Um, with the, the loop after loop of advertising that doesn't serve anybody um, and, and brings not really nothing but negative. Um, there's no benefit to the city, there's no cost to the operators because they have such de minimis uh, fees. We have enormous concerns um, about the dangers and the and, and what comes with the tour buses. If anything, we would like to see these meaningful uh, controls passed and even more reduction in what we already have because it is already too much and as we face the in the what, what has been called the L apocalypse when the L train goes away um, as our streets become more and more congested with more and more surface this becomes essential so to keep it brief, I urge you to pass this packet of legislation, and the only thing that I would ask is even fewer tour buses, that the limits be lower, and that the 
um, that the requirements be more stringent and that the costs on the operators be greater. And thank you so much. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for testifying. Okay, with that said, this, this meeting uh, has come to conclusion. Uh, we'll, we'll take the time after, after this hearing to uh, review everyone's testimony and, and consider on, on what's the best way to move forward on all of these bills. So thank you for coming. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you. No, thank you, Margaret.